Welcome, listeners, to Snippet Sports Science Podcast, sponsored by EliteForm.com and supported by listeners like you on the crowdfunding platform Patreon. I'm your host today, Jared Coma Stark, and Chris is here too. How are you doing, Chris? <laughs> oh, good, mate. It's great to be back finally. My uh, my brawn, your brain, back together again. I, th- I think I think you mean my brawn and your brain. Pretty sure. Well, a bit of both. Yeah, could be a bit of both. We'll, yeah. we'll let the audience decide. We should put up a poll for the audience. Yeah. <laughs> so what, what have we got today, Jared? Today's article is titled, Influence of a 30-Day Slow-Paced Breathing Intervention Compared to Social Media Use on Subjective Sleep Quality and Cardiac Vagal Activity. So we're doing a bit of sleep quality with the, with the podcast now. That's one of our themes as well, is sleep as one of the major pillars of health. And this is a very European study with researchers from Germany, France, and the UK. I think it's really relevant as well, as we all know, that the whole phone, social media, call it an epidemic, call it what you want, has, has taken over everyone's life. You're just walking around the streets and people get their head down all the time. And it's actually known out there that a lot of computer screen, a lot of bright lights prior to sleeping really affects the quality of our sleep. And you know, when we'll look at this article, I thought this had real good relevance to where we're currently at in today's society. 100%. I actually, I saw a really funny article recently. I think it was published in Nature. So it was meant to be a really high quality study. But then people have come back and, and refuted it a little bit that apparently because people have had their heads down looking at their phones so much that it sort of strained the tendons on the back of the neck. And, you know, when you have a tendon pulling on the bone or, or a ligament, I, I'm not really sure, I assume it's a tendon, it, uh, it's created a little bit of a bone spur on the back of young people's heads. And so they developed a bone horn on the back of their heads from looking at their phones too much. Yeah, I'm surprised there's something not going on with people's hands or thumbs as well. Oh, 100%. Yeah, I reckon the rates of arthritis will be huge and, and everything. But, yeah, your points on the sleep quality are much more pertinent and that's what's relevant for today's article so as the article introduces it we've we've kind of gone off tangent but it still has that relevance about you know sleep qualities have that direct impact on life quality although we were starting to get a little bit off topic there really what we were introducing is is that the quality of sleep is obviously impacting people's life quality when these authors looked at this study They looked into breathing techniques, a part of traditional methods used to improve sleep. However, their influence on the psychophysiological variables related to sleep is still unclear. So looking at some of those things associated with sleep disturbances that we want to overcome, the researchers are saying that a lot of those disturbances are likely due to hyperarousal. The parasympathetic nervous system just isn't activated enough, whereas you have a lot more sympathetic nervous system activation. And that's we have very unnecessarily stressful lives and we need to be doing a little bit more to actively relax. The one way in this study that they focus on to do this, to slow people down, is to use slow paced breathing. Right. So people usually breathe at a rate of between 12 to 20 cycles per minute. And what they're doing in this study is they're going to bring them down to a slow pace of only six cycles per minute. And by pace, what they mean is the participants will follow a some sort of uh, a pacer. So whether that's visual, auditory, or kinesthetic, in the case of this study, it is a visual pacing. Uh, it tells them exactly how long that they should be exhaling versus inhaling. And with respect on how to explain the positive effects of performing slow-paced breathing at six cycles per minute, there's some processes they talk about in relation to a model. Uh, and there's four here. The first one is the phase relationship between heart rate oscillations and breathing at six cycles per minute. Secondly, the phase relationship between the heart rate and blood pressure oscillations at the same breathing rate. Thirdly, the, the activity of the baroreflex. And fourthly, the resonance characteristics of the cardiovascular system. Combine these processes are expected to strengthen the homeostasis in the baroreceptor which results in improving the gas exchanges at the level of the alveoli and increasing valgal afferences. Right. So we're not going to go too much, I think, into that resonance model. But if the listeners want to read a bit more on that, they can look up the article by Lehrer. Uh, it's titled, How Does Heart Rate Variability Biofeedback Work? Resonance, the Barrow Reflex, and Other Mechanisms. 
correct me if I'm wrong here, Jared, really what they're saying is they're going to use heart rate variability to measure the effectiveness of this intervention. Yeah, that's the, that's the base of it. And specific measures from heart rate variability, because, you know, we can, we can get so many different measures out of heart rate variability. In this introduction, I talk a lot about the cardiac vagal activity. And there's several theories that highlight the role of this in a phenomenon such as emotion and stress regulation, executive cognitive performance, social functioning, and health. So therefore, in order to better understand cardiac vagal activity functioning, it's important to consider several levels of functioning, resting, reactivity, and recovery. And this can be influenced by many factors. And slow based breathing is a straightforward method to increase this cardiac vagal activity resting level. Werner and colleagues have argued that assessing cardiac vagal activity while sleeping is suboptimal because cardiac vagal activity is supposed to reflect adaptions to environmental changes. And they say that these generally do not occur during the night. My personal take on that is, I don't know what sort of dreamland other people are living in, that they have no environmental changes while they're sleeping. <laughs> yeah. I, I think there's quite a few environmental changes while you're sleeping, um, if not in your actual environment during the night, at least internally, there's quite a few environmental changes. And I would say, actually, the fact that you're going to sleep is an environmental change in the first place, and that you will be waking up, as well as the stages, uh, the cycles between REM sleep and non-REM sleep. Those are, I mean, it's produced internally, but to an extent, it could be considered an environmental change because you're experiencing it. That's right. And with respect to the measurement here, they thought it can't be considered as an index of sleep quality, but it may provide an indication of the restorative status of the body during sleep. And this potentially could give a good index in the activity of the parasympathetic nervous system. Yeah, and it seemed a little reminiscent to me of how we consider testosterone and cortisol not to directly signal anabolic and catabolic activity, but rather be a biomarker for behaviors that result in more anabolic or catabolic activity. Yeah, totally right, or, or alternatively a marker of readiness to compete. Right, so this, what, the way they're using this is sort of a readiness for restoration. So the alternative here is, is that rather than taking it during the night, is to potentially use it during an awakening morning period. In relation to this, they called it CVA morning. And this has been suggested as a good compromise given the individual has not usually experienced heavy environmental changes beforehand. This measure, CVA morning, has been related to subjective indices of well-being and to physical training adaptations, and also more recently to subjective sleep quality measurements. So therefore, investigating both the morning together with the nighttime cardiac vagal activity measurements potentially seems to be an appropriate combination to further understand the effects of slow-paced breathing on this activity. When in doubt, use both. And obviously, one thing that we've spoken about a lot, Jared, is that the use of subjective questionnaires, the amount of information we can get from subjects is fabulous, isn't it? 100%. They do speak later in the study that there's no agreed upon objective measure of sleep quality. And the thing is, I think that'll really just turn out to be reductionist at the end of the day is uh, just as we've seen for like readiness to train or, or lots of other athletic measures, it's really the subjective that actually matters. And so subjective sleep quality might be important than any objective measure we ever find. That's right. That individuality that it can get out of it. Now, with respect to the aims and the hypothesis, the aims of the study was to address previous research gaps, investigating the effects of a 30-day slow-paced breathing intervention on subjective sleep quality and cardiac vagal activity at night and in the morning. And from that, the authors hypothesized that in comparison to a control condition involving spontaneous breathing, this 30-day slow-paced breathing intervention would increase subjective sleep quality, as well as the measures for cardiac vagal activity over the night and the morning. Getting into the materials and methods, they recruited 64 participants, about 50-50 male-female, aged 18 to 29 years old, so fairly young people, with normal BMI 18.5 to less than 25 kilos per meter squared. They also excluded any participants who scored lower than a five on the Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index, which would indicate that they had a sleep disorder. So they excluded anyone who might have a potential sleep disorder. 
getting into the Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index. It's a self-report questionnaire that assesses sleep quality for the last four weeks preceding when the participant took the questionnaire. So it's looking at their last four weeks of sleep reported by themselves into the questionnaire. It has a total of 18 items, each of which is scored between zero and three, looking at subjective sleep quality, sleep latency, sleep duration, habitual sleep efficiency, sleep disturbances, use of sleep medication, and daytime dysfunction. This gives an overall score between zero and 21. The next measure was cardiac vagal activity via high frequency heart rate variability. Essentially what they did here, they used an ECG device, and this was used during the experiment to assess heart rate variability with a sampling rate of 500 hertz. And this is actually quite a common type measure that you can actually purchase from um, pre-existing products out there. Yep, and just a quick note that they looked at the high frequency heart rate variability. So that's 0.15 to 0.42 hertz. Moving on to the intervention, the, the two groups they had, the first one was the experimental group, the slow paced breathing. With this, they had to practice these techniques for 15 minutes before going to sleep using the smartphone app, Breathe Pacer, where on this it displayed a flower, slowly adding pedals to indicate inhalation over 4.5 seconds and exhalation over 5.5 seconds. Participants had to inhale via the nose and exhale via pursed lips. And this respiratory pattern was based on previous research investigating the influence of slow-paced breathing on psychophysiological outcomes. I thought that was quite a good respiratory pattern for them to use because they did mention that the exhalation should be longer than the inhalation because the exhalation phase is what stimulates the vagal nerve. But I thought it was quite good as well that they included the pursed lips. And I may have spoken about this previously on the podcast. I'm not sure. But what I've heard, is it's been very difficult for me to find actual research on this, but what I've heard is that when you exhale against some pressure, so that's when you're exhaling with the pursed lips that'll, that'll actually make the noise. Like uh, a lot of people would have seen people practicing yoga using this type of breathing. And that particularly does some sort of mechanical stimulus to the vagal nerve. And that's a lot of what activates the parasympathetic system. Yeah, right. Just what I've heard. I don't, I don't know if it's really that supported by research, but that's the hypothesis that I've heard. Say with conviction and it's true. The second group, the control group, was a social media use. And in this, they were given no specific instructions related to breathing patterns. And they chose this as the control group because it's pretty common among all of us that that's sort of the typical use before going to bed is most people will be on social media for that 15 minutes before bedtime. And although this is probably possibly something in the discussion, one thing that I was thinking about when they were doing this was, you know, they talk about the type of light emitted from smartphone devices. You would typically think that like a social media would be quite bright. And I wonder if breathing app actually was a much better color. So when you're looking at it, it's not going to emit that same bright light, which is going to affect you know, your potential sleep patterns. Yeah, that's a great point. With the, with the intensity of the light and the blueness of the light, a lot of people are encouraged before you, you go to bed, maybe that hour or two before bedtime, dim your screens and have a blue light filter so your screen will be a bit reddish. A little bit more about the procedure. We've obviously explained in detail about the two different intervention groups. Then what happened here was the participants were asked to have a similar day structure for both evaluation days on pre-test and post-test. And then no intervention was performed in the evening preceding the pretest and post-test night measurements. The participants were told to start the device before going to bed, write down the time when they went to bed, and then turn off the light. During the 30-day intervention, participants had to confirm every night via an on-light form that they either did the slow-paced breathing exercise for the experimental group or that they used social media. So they ensured that they actually had adherence to the actual experiment. At the end of the intervention, participants were coming back to the lab to get the ECG device for the post-test and filled out the questionnaire on sleep quality as well. We've got a pre-test and a post-test with that ECG with a 30-day intervention in between. So they are looking at chronic changes over a one-month period. So there you go. That's the study put together. We're now going to go on to the results. I can cover the stats a little bit. So if you aren't interested in statistics, go ahead and click that fast forward button real quickly because I'm going to go through it now. 
First, the researchers checked for any outliers and normal distribution. Outliers were defined as 3.3 standard deviations, and those were Windsorized 3.3%. Given that the heart rate variability data found not to be normally distributed, they log transformed it at log 10, as recommended by other researchers. Then they performed a repeated measures A NOVA with the time condition as a within subject variable and the condition experiment versus control as between subject. Ad hoc, they did t test to look for significance with a Bonferroni correction to 0 0.05 divided by 4 equals 0 0.0125. So instead of using that sort of typical p value of 0 0.05 due to the number of measurements that they looked at. Finally, they did a couple of Pearson's correlations were run to look at the difference at the PSQI change and the CBA night change and between the PSQI change and the CBA morning. They also looked at effect sizes, which they indicated via partial eta squared and Cohen's D. Wow, that's a fair bit going on there. I was actually pretty happy with their statistical analysis. They, because they picked up on a couple of things that I often see missing in these types of studies, but like just the simple things of actually looking for outliers and checking if your data is normally distributed before you analyze it. Yeah, definitely. So I'm going to go into the results here and you'll probably pick up a few things that I won't. I'm one of those guys that fast forward the statistics section. <laughs> I mean, you're the one, the guy that reads it. So I think that's a good combination for us. Right. When they initially looked at the results for the sleep questionnaire, the initial results showed that there was no significant differences between both conditions at pretest. So the groups were nice and even but there was a tendency for a difference between the conditions at post-test, such as the sleep questionnaire score was lower for the experimental slow breathing group in comparison to the control group. And concerning the simple main effects for time, there was also a significant difference between pre-test and post-test for the experimental group, such as that the score from the questionnaire decreased, which therefore indicated that there was a higher subjective sleep quality and there was no significant difference was found for the control group. In other words, slow breathing helps for sleep quality as indicated by a lower value on the questionnaire. Makes sense. With respect to cardiac vagal activity through the night, concerning the simple main effects for time, there was a significant difference between pretest and post-test for the experimental group. In other words, the vagal activity increased but there was no significant difference was found for the control group. Once again, indicating that slow breathing techniques work. Now moving on to the other CVA measurement, which was the morning measurement. What they found here was that the simple main effects for time, there was a tendency for a difference between pre-test and post-test for the experimental group. And once again here, they showed that the activity score increased, but there was no significant difference was found for the control group. The last one that they looked at here was the relationship between cardiac vagal activity and the questionnaire score. And there was a significant correlation between the change in the night measure over the vagal activity and the questionnaire score, where P was 0.018 with a negative regression of 0.29, while a tendency was found regarding the relationship between the change in the questionnaire score and the morning activity where P was 0.052, so not significant, just outside that, with a similar negative regression. And this negative correlation reflects the fact that a decrease in the questionnaire score between pre and post tests is related to subjective sleep quality improvements. In other words, the score for the questionnaire goes down. Hopefully, we should see that an indication of that sleep quality increase in that cardiac vagal activity measurement through heart rate variability. And just a quick note on the breathing frequency, uh, because they did also look at the breathing, breathing frequency from pre to post, there were no chronic changes in the breathing frequency, which just means that the cardiac vagal activity changes were not driven by changes in breathing. So what do you think about that, Jared? I like that. I think it's a great study. One of the things I particularly liked is that they use that 15 minute time period you, know, you and I have talked about meditation and breathing quite a bit before. And one of the really cool studies that I've seen, maybe we'll pull it up, is that the easiest time to adhere to for meditation or a breathing exercise like this is 15 minutes. Less than 15 minutes, if people feel like it's not worth it, more than 15 minutes and it's too much of a commitment. 
So I really enjoy seeing the intervention of breathing or meditation with that 15 quality because I think it's one of the most practical interventions you can do. Just noting again that following Werner and colleagues, the researchers are not arguing that the cardiac vagal activity at night represents an indicator of sleep quality. They're suggesting that the cardiac vagal activity at night is a restorative function of the parasympathetic nervous system. And it just makes sense to me. You know, there's no time when your parasympathetic activity should be higher than deep sleep. Uh, parasympathetic is rest and digest. And deep sleep, like stage four sleep, is the most resting that you can be. Totally agree with you there, Jared. I think what it's just saying there is, is that something like this has been well proven over time, part of a really good sleep routine. And I think if it's something that we take time out and incorporate into our own routine, it'll actually give us time to slow down, pause, and actually get us ready for a good night's sleep. Completely agree. I think, and the researchers do right here, that one of the best ways that you could improve this research is including that polysomnography. And of course, that's just a given is you're going to get better sleep information from you. However, this is really practical. It, it gives a great measurement to researchers out there. It's perhaps a bit more applied in that anyone could actually do this. Maybe not the ECG, but anyone can go online and you can download the Portland Sleep Quality Inventory Index, I'm not sure, the PSQI. Yeah, and, and as I said earlier, you know, being able to measure heart rate variability is quite easy, you know, using a heart rate monitor and, and different apps out there. There's lots of programs that can actually do this for you. So if you're a coach out there and you're thinking, well, how can I prove to my athletes this is actually working? You know, you gotta make sure that the, whatever heart rate variability app and products you're using has a level of validity. Uh, however, if you're doing that, it can just give you that extra layer of measurements to say that it is working because some people may like the hard objective data, whereas, as we said earlier, some people just might like that nice objective. Yeah, your sleep quality is better. How are you feeling? I'm feeling much better. Good. Let's keep it going. Right. And you can probably even use something simpler than the PSQI. Uh, probably a simple one to five rating of how was your sleep quality last night is perfectly well, on that note, thanks, Jared. It's been great to finally reconnect. And thank you, listeners, as well. We really appreciate you all coming on each week and also to EliteForm.com. Remember us to visit us on our socials at Snippet Science. Leave us a rating on iTunes and tune in next week.